I'm Dwayne Brown. Tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, protesters block buses carrying immigrants from San Diego to a border patrol station in Murrieta. And as immigrant families arrive, President Obama pledges to take action on immigration reform. How his executive order is likely to impact those families. I'm Peggy Pico. Also ahead, Yosemite National Park and California State Parks celebrate their 150th anniversary. What it means to the future of state parks in San Diego County. Lots of excitement as World Cup fans pack Petco Park today. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Three buses arrived at the Murrieta Border Patrol Station carrying 136 Central American immigrants. They were supposed to go into the station for processing, but the buses never made it into the parking lot. Angry protesters blocked their way. Hello, good evening. Thanks for joining us. KPBS reporter Jill Replogel is just back from Murrieta, and she joins us from the newsroom with more on this story tonight. Uh, Jill, uh, what can you tell us about uh, what went down this afternoon uh, as these immigrants were trying to check into this uh, Border Patrol station? Yeah, well, uh, passions were running very high in Marietta. There were probably about 100 protesters, um, anti-immigrant protesters, upset about the transfer of these Central American families to the San Diego area. Um, when the buses did show up, some of them blocked the buses and kept them blocked for about 15 minutes until they turned around. I spoke with some of them. Um, we can hear from, from one of them right now. I have no problem if they come over here legally at all. You know, welcome to America if you want to come here legally. But legally is the key word. They're not doing it legally. They're coming over here legally. So, so some people said, you know, this is, this is not our problem. Uh, Central America should be dealing with these children. Other people said they had concerns about Border Patrol agents um, having to process a lot of people and being exposed to potential diseases. Um, there were a few people out there in support um, of these immigrants, and we'll hear from one of them right now. I had a feeling there was a lot of negative people going to come out today, and I thought that the other side had needed some support. Uh, these are refugees, not illegal aliens. Uh, uh, I know John Lane would jump to the aid of a uh, refugee. Uh. I also spoke with the, one of the Border Patrol Union representatives there. Um, his, he said the concern among some of the agents is that they're being pulled off of their regular patrol duties. Um, a lot of them are stationed on the highways up there for drug interdiction. And, and so they've been moved in to process these, uh, these families that are coming in. So that's one of their big concerns. And um, we're also uh, getting word that uh, President Obama uh, met earlier today. Mm -hmm. Uh, in regards to the situation. And he says, this is obviously a crisis that needs to be fixed. Our Peggy Pico uh, has more on that. On Monday, President Obama announced he will not wait for a stalled Congress to take action to reform U.S. immigration policy. Here to discuss how the president can change the immigration process through executive action is Ev Mead, director of the Transporter Institute at the University of San Diego. Welcome to Evening Edition. Thanks very much for having me. Now, what is the president legally allowed to do with an executive order in regards to, uh, to change the U.S. immigration policy? Well, there's a lot of discretion in U.S. immigration law, much more so than than you'd find in civil or criminal procedures. So the president can divert resources to the border. He can send immigration judges and border patrol agents to the actual physical border. He can um, he could do things like his broad discretion over who's detained and who's released. He can move cases to the front of the immigration docket. It's something that he doesn't do directly, but it, it would come from him and move through the attorney general and on down through immigration judges. He can also do things like um, appoint uh, counsel to these children. Um, they have a kind of AmeriCorps-like pro program in process, but it'll take a couple of months and maybe even a year to fully implement it. But in the interim, he could do what public defender's offices do all over the country and appoint experienced immigration lawyers to represent the kids. He could also use his prosecutorial discretion, and this is probably the most important part. Let's talk about that a little bit. Um, how can he use it that's different than, let's say, uh, if you were going through the regular process? 
Well, the, in immigration law, the, the prosecutors, the government, they have the discretion not to pursue a removal case uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. And he could order that they do this as a more blanket affair, that they pick a particular subset of migrants arriving on the border, and they make the decision that since they're probably not going to remove them anyway, why go ahead and pursue uh, a year and a half or a two-year long uh, costly set of legal proceedings that just creates an enormous backlog in the U.S. immigration system. The other thing that he could do, and I think this is important because this may likely happen, is he can pursue interdiction efforts in Central America or in Mexico. These uh, haven't proven very effective in the past, and there's some serious questions about whether we've got good partners there in the governments. Right. Didn't, didn't Vice President Biden just get back not too long ago from a, a trip trying to deal with immigration policy? Yeah, he did. And, and, you know, there were some good things about the trip. They talked about long-term economic development. They talked about supporting boys and girls clubs. Um, they talked about strengthening the capacity of these governments. The problem is, again, are they really good partners? Their human rights records are not really good. The, the governments in the region have tried to downplay the violence that a lot of these people are, are alleging is the reason they've come in the first place. And the thing is, the governments have a stake in that. It makes them look really bad for a bunch of people to be showing up on our border saying we're fleeing, you know, organized violence, corruption, um, and, uh, and a horror show for children in these countries. Let's talk about this. You touched on it, diverting resources. Mm -hmm. if the president did divert resources, how would that impact the current immigration system? Well, basically, you would speed up the cases that are at the border. But you're correct to sort of point out or question that the cases that those immigration judges are working on now, their regular docket, would probably be slowed down. If you talk to Border Patrol, they'll tell you that if they move more people to doing this kind of border enforcement, that means they're moving people off of checkpoints and other duties. So that's very true. Do you think right now what you know of the president's strategy with this executive order, do you think it's going to work? It, d it depends on what you mean by working. Do I think it will uh, create a dramatic change in the reality for Central American kids, whether they're coming here or not? And I, I think it's very unlikely to do that. Do I think it will spur immigration reform? I think it's also very unlikely to do that, in part because it's such a mixed message. On the one hand, the president is saying we need to expedite the removal of people, pr you know, uh, process them faster, get them removed to their home countries. But on the other hand, he's saying that he's tired of all the suffering caused by the separation of families and mass deportation. So we're just, it, that, that seems like a very mixed message to me and a conflicting message. Uh, there were protests today in Riverside County mm -hmm. uh, because of families being flown into Murrieta, a lot of children there for processing. What do you make of the public's reaction uh, to what's happening? Well, and we saw this in, in the community meeting in Escondido the other night. People are very angry, and I can understand that as, at a certain logical level, this system looks very much out of control. It looks like we're doing, we're dealing with kind of chaos on a very ad hoc basis. The thing that I would point out is that most of the myths about these folks just aren't true. There's no spread of infectious disease. They should contact the Center for Disease Control if they want to verify that. Th these kids are not criminals. They're mostly kids traveling with their mothers. Um, the, you know, those kinds of risks really aren't there. And the other thing is these people are going to be in San Diego County for a very, very short period of time. And they're not just set free, right? Right. And I did want to correct myself on that. So they were flown into San Diego and driven to Murrieta, where right. they're being processed on that one. So unfortunately, we are out of time. I, I want to let folks know that we have a lot more reaction from San Diego representatives, which we reached out to today, and they can find that information on kpbs.org. Ev Mead, thank you very much. Thanks for having me, Peggy. President Obama met today with his cabinet telling them they need to be creative when Congress doesn't get things done. We're always going to prefer working on a bipartisan basis uh, to get things done. That's what uh, folks expect out of Washington. Uh, they're not looking for excuses and they're not looking for uh, a lot of uh, partisan sniping. The president also is pushing Congress to figure out how to pay for highway and transit improvements. The Highway Trust Fund is set to expire at the end of the summer. A federal watchdog is looking into data discrepancies from California's health insurance exchange. The report says the agency didn't verify important personal information when processing applications such as citizenship and legal residence, and it finds mistakes in entering information from paper applications. Officials with Covered California disagree. They say the report is based on a sample of just 45 applications out of the 1.4 million enrolled. One of the nation's largest wireless companies is in trouble tonight with two federal agencies. The Federal Trade Commission says T-Mobile made millions of dollars by charging customers for subscriptions to texting services without getting permission. The Federal Communications Commission, or FCC, is also looking into the company's billing practices. 
Rite Aid is paying nearly half a million dollars because its pharmacists repeatedly failed to give consultations to patients. State law says the consultations are required whenever a patient gets a new medication or there's a change to their meds. Prosecutors say other pharmacy chains have the same problem. CVS settled a similar case last year. San Diego's two emergency winter shelters shut down today after being open for nearly 20 months. About 700 folks from the shelters are now in temporary or permanent housing. The shelters are set to reopen when the weather gets cooler in November. Speaking of weather, San Diego has closed the books on its rainy season or lack of one. KPBS reporter Susan Murphy says it's the third year in a row of below normal rainfall here. San Diego has wrapped up one of its driest years on record with just a little more than five inches of rain recorded at Lindbergh Field. The annual average for downtown is about 10 and a half inches. That leaves the region's rainfall at 49 percent of normal. The last significant rain accumulation in San Diego County occurred in December 2010 when a rare atmospheric river system brought a wave after wave of storms. National Weather Service meteorologist Alex Tardy says since then, precipitation has been dismal. If you add up all those years, we, we should have 30 inches of rain total, you know, July to July, each year added up. And we're not even close to that. We're short a little over a foot. It has not only been dry, but it's also been very warm. November through May is the warmest ever recorded for that time period. The daily combined high and low temperature at Lindbergh Field was 3.6 degrees above average. The ongoing drought conditions have parched canyons and hillsides and raised the risk of fire danger. The fuels, the vegetation is, is as dry as it can really get, dry as we've seen. Um, on record is the way the fuels are right now and we're just you know getting through the month of June so we're just entering into the summer months. Tardy says there is a glimmer of hope with the brewing El Nino. That's the warming of ocean temperatures in the tropical Pacific that can pull the jet stream south. If it strengthens it could bring more rain producing storms to San Diego but he warns it doesn't always guarantee rain. Right now there is probability that that will give above normal precipitation, at least for the, the late fall and early winter, given what we're expecting to happen. But just a few years ago, in 2006 and 2007, we had an El Nino. That was actually the start of our last drought. Tardy says record-breaking conditions are expected to continue through the summer with above average temperatures and increased heat waves. Susan Murphy, KPBS News. Four weeks after the primary election, we may have a final tally in the California controller's race. Betty Yee has finished in second place. Less than 500 votes separate her from the third place finisher, John Perez. Ashley Swearingen finished first. The vote still has to be certified by the Secretary of State. City of San Diego will dole out 1.2 million bucks to settle a lawsuit by three former members of the San Diego Pension Board. They faced federal and state charges that were later dropped and thrown out. They sued the city in 2011, saying a council resolution promised to indemnify or protect them in case they were sued. About 15 million people a year visit San Diego beaches and parks, and the city is a popular destination for Fourth of July revelers. That's why. Police will be out in force along with temporary trash and recycling bins. There is no glass allowed on the beach, so a reminder, if you're going to have things like ketchup, mustard, relish, that kind of stuff, jars, make sure it's plastic. And when they're done with it, let's make sure that they put all necessary trash in its proper receptacles. It's not every day you hear a cop talking about the virtues of recycling, but San Diego has come a long way since banning alcohol and smoking at beaches and bay parks. Police Captain J.R. Hera. Again, all surrounding areas. We're talking about not just the sand. We're talking the boardwalk, the grass areas, the adjacent lots to, to the beach areas. A coalition of groups, including I Love a Clean San Diego, are asking beach and park goers this weekend to enjoy the scene but keep it clean by reducing your coastal footprint and the amount of trash you leave behind. The purpose is to prevent litter from entering the beach and the ocean. 
Over the past seven years, they've collected more than two and a half million pounds of trash and recyclables using temporary trash bins. Pauline Martinson is with I Love a Clean San Diego. It's so important that our children that attend, they come to the beach over this holiday weekend, that they see how, how it is to, to have fun in a clean beach. And so in there, when they grow up, they can take their kids to the beach on 4th of July, and it can still be as pristine. For those who break the law, the Instant Justice Program is back this year, allowing offenders to work off their fine on Monday, July 7th. Jamie Ledesma is with the city attorney's office. In lieu of six hours of community service cleaning up the beach, no criminal charges will be filed for that individual. Reduce, reuse, and recycle. That's the message this holiday weekend. About 100 temporary trash bins are being set up near popular parks and beaches. On Saturday, volunteers will gather at Belmont Park for the morning after the fourth cleanup. Neighbors and business owners in Ocean Beach are telling visitors to turn over their marshmallows this holiday weekend. KPBS editor Tom Fudge joins us from the newsroom with more on this sticky situation. Tom, folks there are hoping for an Independence Day without an OB tradition. We're talking about that annual marshmallow fight. Tell us why. Three words, Dwayne, big sticky mess on the streets and sidewalks of OB. Uh, you know, when that marshmallow fight began in the 1980s, it wasn't a big deal. There weren't many people being involved. But last year, there were thousands of people throwing marshmallows at each other, and it spilled onto the streets and sidewalks. And the very next day, July 5th, you couldn't walk on those streets without that goo pulling your shoe off your foot. They yeah. tried to scrape it up. They Oops. tried to steam blast it. They couldn't do anything. It's still there. Absolutely. I was out there the day after. So what's the town council in OB uh, doing to try to stop this marshmallow fight? Well, they have uh, people taking a pledge not to sell marshmallows. They're asking people to mellow out, spelled with an A. <laughs> And uh, basically, it's just persuasion. They're trying to tell people if you come to the fireworks at Ocean Beach, if you bring marshmallows, eat them, don't throw them. And uh, you talked to a guy, uh, the man on the beach in OB. What does he think about this marshmallow fight? Well, people sitting on the seawall, there are some people who thought it was a good idea, but especially those people who lived in Ocean Beach uh, didn't like it, and uh, they hope that it becomes a part of the past. We'll find out on Friday. All right. Do you think uh, public opinion has changed in general about this uh, sticky situation? Well, I think it has. I think over the past uh, two years, we really have seen, like I said, thousands of people out there throwing marshmallows, and it really does just create a tremendous mess. And um, people in Ocean Beach don't want people messing up their community. Understandable. KPBS editor Tom Fudge. Yosemite and the California State Park System are celebrating their 150th anniversary. Peggy Pico takes a look at what makes our county parks right here some of the most visited in California. President Abraham Lincoln declared Yosemite California's first state park back in 1864. Not long after, Yosemite became a national park, and much of the world has since adopted the concept of national parks. Joining me with more on the viability and value of our state parks is San Diego County State Park Superintendent Clay Phillips. Welcome to Evening Edition. Thank you. Now, Clay, give us a range of the types of state parks uh, that are here throughout California. Oh, um, it, it California state park system is by far the most diverse state system in the nation. Uh, we have uh, the, the lush, dark redwood forests, uh, giant sequoia trees. Uh, we have uh, the vast, op vast openness of Anza Borrego Desert State Park right here in San Diego County. Uh, we, we manage uh, more uh, ocean frontage than any other agency, over 300 miles of California's shoreline, all the recreation, especially in the southern half of the state, uh, that comes with that. Uh, but also, state parks is really the the prime storyteller of the, the whole grand saga of California, uh, going all the way back to uh, Native American villages, communities, uh, through the gold mining era, and all the way to the 20th century. And that makes me wonder what sort of criteria is 
is there for a park to be designated as a state park? Well, it has to, it has to be part of this, the statewide story, whether it's a significant natural resource or historic resource or a significant recreation resource that, that we wouldn't want to just leave in the hands of, of a local community because so many other Californians uh, would utilize it. Uh, how many uh, parks do we have in San Diego County and what makes our state parks here unique? We have 11 state parks in, in well, I'm sorry, in my district because I only cover the coastal half of, of San Diego County. So in my district, I have 11 state parks. Uh, two of those are operated by the city of Encinitas. So I directly manage nine state parks. And what makes those unique is is actually it's a little microcosm of, of the entire state park system. We have the intensively used uh, state beaches, uh, but we also have just significant natural resource areas both in at Torrey Pine State Reserve which people are very familiar with and at the Tijuana Estuary uh, at Borderfield State Park which f very few people are familiar with but is probably the environmental gem of San Diego uh, County. I understand that Old Town San Diego is the most visited state park. Oh. Why do so many visitors uh, go there? Do you think, and and you know, how does it get to? Uh, how do they get to know that this is a state park, or do they? Well, I, I'd I'd like to think that they they want to go there to learn about the history of state parks, and many many do, and they want that 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 old time experience of going into a, an honest to goodness. Uh, you know, nineteenth century house of of a Mexican you know uh, owner. Uh, but it's much more than that. We have some terrific concessionaires that that uh, you know provide a, a unique experience in in dining, both Mexican and American. And we have some great vendors in the parks that that just give a different kind of experience that you can't get anywhere else in San Diego. Well, there's been a, uh, of course, people know about this: the park fee increases, budget cuts, and then there was that multi-million dollar secret surplus scandal a few years back. What is the financial health of California's state park system now? You know, we're, we're still a very broken system because we've been essentially level funded for so many decades that uh, we're, my staff and my counterparts are passionate about California state parks. And we'll keep trying to do whatever we can to serve the public and protect the resources uh, at at whatever you give us. But the problem is that the peanut butter has been spread so thin that it's barely tasty anymore. I mean, we are we are broken and insufficiently funded in almost every area that we should be responsible for, whether it's it's public safety or resource protection or maintenance of our facilities. And uh, by way of example, uh, well, well, let me ask you this first. The, the Parks Forward Initiative, I understand, is conducting a review of the park system. Mm -hmm. Are these some of the issues being addressed, or what issues are they addressing? Well, they're addressing uh, a whole wealth of issues, and, I, and I'm personally thrilled by, uh, by the creation of the Parks Forward Commission because I think it's a chance for... Uh, for people to ha provide a fresh look at state parks uh, from the outside. I mean, I'm I'm on the inside and I can whine all I want, but nobody's going to listen to me. But but when uh, experienced leaders from the outside say the same thing, they're going to get people's attention and they're going to be addressing things like creative ways to fund state parks. Uh, uh, they're going to be looking at ways to make state parks more relevant. And that's very important because uh, the demographics of California are changing. And uh, the people that grew up uh, going camping at a state park because their parents took them um, are not the majority of people in, state, in the state of California. So we need to be more relevant. And we will stay tuned to see how this progresses with this uh, Park Forward initiative. Clay Phillips, thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. San Diego City Council signed off on a plan to sink a decommissioned warship off Mission Bay. The destroyer used to belong to the Canadian Navy. It would become a new underwater reef, and it's expected to draw plenty of scuba divers. The State Coastal Commission still has to approve the plan. The ship could be brought here early next year. Scripps Memorial Hospital in Encinitas unveiled its expanded emergency department today. Scripps says the hospital needed more space as the population in the surrounding area has been growing since 2000, and annual visits to the ER have more than doubled. The facility has 36 patient rooms. 
Judy Woodruff on the next news hour. Iraq's parliament meets to pick their next prime minister in the face of a raging insurgency. That's Tuesday on the PBS News Hour. A huge crowd at Petco Park this afternoon to watch the U.S. take on Belgium in the World Cup. Look at that. But today's match was the end of the line for the U.S. Belgium won 2-1 to one to advance to the quarterfinals. More warm weather for us over the next few days. A bit cloudy along the coast. Temperatures there mostly in the low 70s. In the inland valleys, temperatures a bit warmer in the 80s with a mix of sun and clouds over the next few days. Clear and sunny in the mountains, temperatures in the upper 80s. As for the desert, no change, just downright hot, triple digits across the board with plenty of sun. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. You have a great night.